All right, let's switch to the next talk. Finally, it's my honor to introduce my friend, Dr. Jiang Wu from University of Vanderbilt. Her interesting talk title is Assessing Surgeon Proficiency, Proficiency Through Action and Attention. Jiang, please. Thanks, Rajiv, for the introduction. And so I catching up. So uh, my Lab at Vanderbilt, um, I started in January, so this talk is still on the aspirational side of what I hope to accomplish, it's like on the results, but I got a DVRK, or in my case, a very fancy paperweight, since I don't have the controller board yet, as many of you know, there's been a chip shortage, so I can't move my robot, which makes it really interesting to give a talk on how to use machine learning for robotics. So bear with me on some of the extrapolations I'm going to do. But one of the uh, collaborations that has been the most fruitful for me so far at Vanderbilt has been to look at kidney stone surgery. So one of the issues they have with kidney stone surgery is a high reoperation rate where the uh, patient gets the surgery and a third of them have to come back within the next six months because the surgeon didn't get all the kidney stones out and they need to reoperate. And one of the challenges the surgeons think is causing this is that the novice surgeons have a difficult time imagining the 3D structure of the kidney from the CT scans and mapping it to the endoscope video. You can see on the left that the endoscope video looks nothing like what they see on the CT scan, right? And so if you don't actually explore the whole kidney, you miss stones. If you see a stone fly off your screen and you lose track of where it went in this kidney, you miss stones. So how do we uh, tackle this? So the first thing is we want to see how well the surgeons actually explore the whole kidney when they make their first evaluation. One thing my student has been working on is to track their eye gaze while they explore various kidney models. And we also tried this in the operating room. I don't have pictures for that, so I'll focus on the phantom study case. But what we did was we got three gel phantoms and we stuck these needles in the phantoms and asked the surgeon to look for all three pins we, um, on the three phantoms. We did this with five surgeons so far and uh, three attendings, actually six surgeons, three attendings, three uh, residents. And we've measured uh, so far what we found is of course the attendings are able to find all the pins much quicker. And we're analyzing the eye gaze data for where did they actually look at while they were trying to do this task. So here we're uh, using the Microsoft HoloLens as an eye tracker so we can match their eye gaze to a real world environment using the uh, model of the world that the uh, HoloLens builds. And so results pending for what we find, hopefully we will find out soon. The application of this to robot is we're also developing a headset for people to use while they're using the Da Vinci. So we wanted to track their eye gaze on the surgeon console of the Da Vinci but we found that putting the eye camera on the console directly didn't work for people's eyes. When they moved their head, the calibration was off and we lost track of their uh, eye gaze very quickly. One thing we thought we could do to compensate is to mount the sensors directly on their um, eyes using an eyeglass frame. But with commercial systems, we found that the eye tracking was bad. The commercial systems are designed so you're looking uh, at the world as I'm looking at you, you're looking at me right now. And that's not how people look into the surgeon console. People tend to look much more down in the surgeon console. And that's not a region that we found commercial trackers worked well for tracking. And so we 3D printed our own and we mounted some pupil labs uh, sensors on there. And then that brought us to the next challenge of how do we calibrate this to the system? And so one of the more typical ways you have for calibrating eye tracking systems is you move your head around while you uh, look at a single spot. That didn't work for us because you can't really move your head around in the surgeon console. So instead we ask people to keep their heads still and move their eyeballs around. This was shown in the earlier uh, video in the introduction, but essentially we developed this calibration scheme where we move targets around the uh, this 
serial display of the surgeon console and ask people to track the target. And we show that the, uh, we got very minimal errors after the tracking, uh, much less than a degree um, after we performed the calibration. One thing we're trying to figure out right now is how quickly do we lose this calibration? So uh, the calibration pipeline is the person is looking through their glasses. The glasses to the eyeball has one calibration that's done because you're moving your eyeballs and that stays constant. But the next calibration is your eye glasses to the stereo display of the surgeon console. And that will change if you move your head a lot. And so without more consideration for how to keep the surgeon's head inside the console at the same place at the same time, or at all times, uh, we need to figure out how quickly our calibration actually deteriorates as the um, surgeon is doing the operation. So that's work in progress. But, you know, if they keep their head in there all the time, we can track their eyes on the console. And we, um, one of the things that we're also trying to explore more is how much stereo disparity we actually need to account for. So the, we're calculating tar the targets to be offset in the left and right view on at certain depth levels, but how many depth levels do we need to explore to have um, keep a good accuracy for the workspace? So we're trying to quantify those right now. And also results soon to be out to a conference near you. So that's one aspect of where surgeons are looking at, but that doesn't help. Um, just assessing where they're looking at doesn't necessarily help them do their job better. What we're trying to explore in that venue is can we actually create better models of the scene that are easier to understand? So from the, the bottom uh, arrows, I think more straightforward, you can segment a CT image and get your 3D model of the kidney structure. This is the vasculature inside. It's not perfect segmentation, but if you can show the surgeons the model, maybe that helps them when they're visualizing where they are in the kidney. And so that's just applying standard segmentation, um, deep learning segmentation techniques. The top one is slightly more interesting in that we're trying to reconstruct the uh, structure from motion of the endoscope camera. So the point cloud you see in the top right is the structure from motion uh, created point cloud, the red uh, camera or the red path through there is the camera path. And that image is a little bit fake because we actually did that on a mesh rendered kidney, not the real endoscope video because real endoscope is challenging. But this gives you the idea of sort of where we're aiming for that. If we could construct where the camera is in the kidney and show the surgeon that on the preoperative model, Maybe that helps them explore the whole kidney or at least tell them, hey, you haven't actually looked at this whole lobe here. Um, so maybe you should do that. As I mentioned, it doesn't really work right now on real endoscope videos. And well, it kind of works. One of the issues we have is surgeons are doing surgery as they normally do, right? They're not doing it for um, helping us create the best data. So it turns out this part matches the middle portion of the kidney. And that works great because that's a complicated structure. They're spending a lot of time moving at it. One of the basic things we need for structure for motion is that it's not, the camera's not moving super quickly. So great. If the structure is complicated, the surgeon's spending a lot of time to look at it. Excellent. If the structure is not complicated, so like the diagonal left, uh, top left to bottom right axis of the 3D model, the surgeon moves through that super quickly and they don't get enough pictures in the meantime, uh, meantime to actually create the accurate representation. And so, you know, we're trying to figure out is it actually clinically feasible to ask the surgeon to slow down a little in it? How much does it add to the operation time? Does it matter? Uh, but I think if we could do that, we could create a uh, point cloud um, reconstruction from the endoscope video better. And that at least solves some of the issues we could, um, we've been encountering. Why not? Um, so, and we know that our proposed system more or less works because we, um, using the PIX-SFM uh, structure for motion based on deep learning based um, image descriptor on the mesh images. So this is just a mesh generated in 3D slicer where we move the camera to explore the kidney. It reconstructs straight we get the exact kidney shape that we're looking for back. And so 
this should carry over to the endoscope images if we could do good enough endoscope image processing and get the same sort of path that we're expecting from the um, mesh models. So another uh, thing we're currently working on is can we actually teach the uh, a pre-processing algorithm of some sort to learn what features are useful for the structure for motion algorithm. And so the inspiration here is, well, it worked great for the mesh images. So what if we just teach the, um, again, uh, here to pre-process the endoscope images to look like the uh, mesh images. It's a little bit sketchy in that the scan doesn't have temporal information. So how do we know one image will match the mesh generated in the next image? That's not guaranteed, but so far qualitatively, we found reasonably decent results for consistency of what it's picking up. So hopefully that works. We'll see the results also to come. And so that is a lot of non-robot things. So the last part of my talk will go back to uh, robot since I think that's what I'm supposed to be talking about here. And so this is based on some previous work I did during my PhD where we found out that if we teach a neural network to learn the implicit model of a robot, we can do reasonable torque estimation for free space motion. So if we feed in the velocity and position of a joint, we can estimate how much torque it should be doing, um, trying to achieve that motion in free space. And if we combine that with the actual measured torque at any point in time in testing, we find that we can do a reasonable force estimation um, by then multiplying it with the inverse Jacobian to achieve sensorless force estimation. So that's the first generation. Back to the issue of I have really fancy paperweights and I cannot move my Da Vinci uh, robot. The solution to that was to take the second generation, which I promise will be coming to the rest of the world at some point soon. Um, but we got a controller board for the SI that we're open sourcing. And as a guinea pig, testing it out before re uh, distributing to the wider community. But we'll want to see if the same ideas work for the second generation robot. The second generation robot should ideally work even better since it has more accurate joints, uh, better sensors. But we're currently testing that in our lab with the four sensor. One of the other things we're working on is the redesign of the controller boards has necessitated a change in the FPGA we use. So this is the next generation of the DaVinci Research Kit controllers. It will have a system of um, on a chip design. So it will have a CPU that directly runs with the FPGA in conjunction with the FPGA. We want to explore whether we can do some of the uh, force estimation directly on the uh, CPU side of it and maybe map some of the neural network parts of the FPGA for faster calculation, but whether using the higher frequency signals will get us better force estimation and whether that allows us to calculate force estimation at a high enough rate for haptic feedback and such fun things. And I think first time today, I will end early and take questions. Thank you so much. Let's thank our speaker, Dr. Wu. Any questions from Jing? All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead, Manu, please. Thanks. I've been following your work for force estimation with the DVRK. Um, I, I just had a question. Um, if you assume that the force is applied at the tip, right? Or would your method also... Uh, would it be equally good if there would be additionally forces at another location of the instrument or if there would be at the body wall some kind of forces would that uh, be a problem right um i didn't mention this but there was a another paper that tries to estimate the body wall force and so it makes some assumptions that the body wall force doesn't change but um what we did was a two step method where we had a set of neural networks that estimated the torques of each joint, and then another set of neural networks that estimates a correction factor to account for the body wall. And so it's just additional um, 
torque, I guess, when you're interacting with the body wall, right? Yeah, I guess so. So, so you would not have another sensor for it. It would be. A... We're trying to do this all without adding sensors so that we can actually apply it to clinical cases at some point. Okay. Nice. Any other questions? Thanks for the great talk uh, regarding your work about kidney stone surgery. What other uh, performance criteria do you assess apart from eye movement and like um, probably um, needles found and time required for doing this? So, so far we haven't considered other options. Um, I would love to be able to track the path of the endoscope, but unfortunately our experimental setup just doesn't allow for that right now. Um, I'm wondering how that could apply for a uh, da Vinci surgery. I mean, I'm wondering as in I have plans currently to try that for liver surgery where we can actually measure the kinematics as well and combine it with some of the um, work that's been done in the DVRK community on skill assessment from robot endoscope and um, kinematics motion. Mm -hmm. But um, for the kidney stone, I'm not really sure what else we could measure other than completion time and sort of performance and eye movements. Okay, thank you. All right. So we have a question over Zoom. Uh, let me ask from Jane. So, thanks for the nice talk. I'm very interested about the real-time performance for the force estimation. Can you give more details about that? Um, real-time force estimation for Da Vinci, I guess. Uh, you. Real, were. I mean, we can achieve real-time force estimation more or less in the current system, it'll be as quickly as you can get data from the DVRK controller boards, essentially. Mm -hmm. But that's, in my experience, tops at about 900 hertz, which isn't high enough for a lot for haptics feedback. We haven't done a solid study on the delay, which I think is more of the issue. Um, I think with some of the ROS2 um, changes, we might be able to guarantee better real-time performance. But right now, I would be hesitant to guarantee it real time. We have done um, sensing studies where we ask um, people to determine the stiffness of a phantom by uh, palpating it, and that works. But I don't know if it works well enough for any task that is more, I guess, sensitive than the palpation task. Okay. So one last question, yes. Uh, thank you for the talk. I was I had a question about the converting of the endoscope video to have like the features you were talking about for, I think it was structure for motion. Mm -hmm. How long are the videos that you're able to convert and have temporal consistency for? Um, Does that make sense? As in this picture? Right. So when you're converting and stitching frames together, yeah. how long are, is the model able to capture the consistency? Oh, sorry. Uh, there's no temporal consistency, which is why this oh. is kind of sketchy. Oh. We're doing frame by frame. And so we're hoping that the GAN learns to pick up on things that are, I guess, volumetric and not just image features. But we have no guarantees right now and that's happening. Uh, I think some of the other things we tried is, so the issue with kidney stone surgery is the kidney is filled with fluid when you're um, doing the surgery, which makes a lot of noise for structure from motion algorithms. And so we're trying some water um, filtering, um, filters based on underwater tests that people have used also to see whether that works better. Cool, thank you. All right, thanks so much, Ying.